Boldwood presents Murder in the Library Written by Anita Davison And read by Una Beeson The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Endell Street Hospital, London, April 1916 Hannah's short walk from Charing Cross Station had brought her to the narrow entrance of the former St Giles workhouse. Partially hidden by Christchurch and marked by a pair of massive iron-studded gates with the words Endell Street Military Hospital in stark white paint. After a cold, wet winter, spring had finally come to London. Buds of colour sprang up between cobblestones and peeked over walls. Hannah consigned her heavier coats to her wardrobe and dressed in a light wool jacket and matching skirt. Giving the bell rope by the gate a sharp tug, she was rewarded by the creak of the huge door swinging open. Good morning, Miss Merrill. The porter swung open the gate, bowing her into a cobbled courtyard. Your day at the library, is it? While her aunt's bookshop was being rebuilt, after an air raid six months before, she suggested Hannah volunteer at the library in the nearby military hospital, not only to fill her empty days, but as her contribution to the war effort. It is, Mr Engel, and a good morning to you. Hannah's returning smile wavered as the gate closed behind her with an ominous metallic clang. Dodging ambulances and tradesmen's vans, Hannah crossed the cobbled courtyard to the short flight of steps to the main door, held open by a slight but bright-eyed young woman wearing the standard indoor uniform of the VADs, a loose-fitting white overall belted at the waist which swamped her diminutive frame. Were you waiting for me, Dinah? Hannah addressed her over one shoulder without breaking stride. Sort of, miss. Dinah fell into step beside her. I need to return these. She nodded to the three books tucked beneath her arm. The patients were discharged yesterday, so I won't be needing them. Dinah's flat vowels betrayed her East End origins. Lowering her voice, she cast a brief glance behind her. Truth is, I'm avoiding Sister Ibbert for a bit. She's run me ragged all night. Hannah grasped the knob of the recreation room door, but it held fast. Leaning, but the door would not budge. It's locked. Frowning, she examined the door as if it could explain itself. Was anyone using the room last night? Not that I know of, Dinah shrugged. Shall I fetch the key for you? If you would, it's kept on a board behind the porter's desk. Won't be a mo. Dinah laid the books on the floor and scampered back the way they had come. Hannah shifted her feet, irritated that her day had started with a delay, though Dinah's sunny disposition helped lighten her mood. Dinah was an older sister of Hannah's bookshop assistant, Archie. A vast family although Hannah had never quite worked out how many of them there were. Dinah came running back in less than a minute. Porter says he doesn't know why the recreation room was locked. Slightly breathless, she handed Hannah a brass key. Says it's usually left open. That's what I thought. The lock clicked under Hannah's hand, and she pushed open the door of the vast recreation room that contained the hospital library. The smells of old paper and cigarette smoke-laden leather assailed her, muffling the antiseptic tang that permeated the hallways. Muted April sunshine flooded through a panoramic window that ran down one side, drawing rectangles of light onto a polished boarded floor. A full-sized billiard table took pride of place in the room, whilst at one end, a small mahogany table borrowed from a titled lady held a brand new phonograph. Glass-fronted cabinets lined one wall containing rows of neatly arranged books, the doors left unlocked so patients and staff alike 
could handle and choose books for themselves. The rule of the library was to provide books on any subject patients requested, so it was equipped with valuable volumes on 17th century furniture, old silver, zoology, and metaphysics all lent by generous patrons. Those patients with specific skills or hobbies honed their craft by making use of the donated handbooks on motors, aeroplanes and engines, while gardeners pored over books on rose growing and argued about their preferred methods. Hannah was also responsible for finding reference books for patients studying for the London matriculation examination, helping them gain knowledge during their enforced leisure hours they might not have had in their previous lives. Weren't you meant to be on nights this week, Dinah? Hannah's gaze went to a clock on the wall as she st- Your shift finished over an hour ago. Yeah, by rights, I should be tucked up in bed in the barracks by now. She referred to the attic dormitories allotted to the nurses. But we're at sixes and sevens today because a patient went missing last night. Missing? Hannah turned from where she was hanging her coat on a hook in the wall. How did that happen? A roll call was taken every evening before the main gate was secured until morning. Dunno. He left the ward after lights out and he's not been seen since. Dinah placed the books she had brought with her on an ancient scarred desk and wandered the room. Talking of locked doors, I couldn't get into the Johnny Walker ward last night either. Hannah's straw hat joined the coat on the hook by the door. Perhaps it was full, she suggested, smiling at the name given to the basement room where inebriated soldiers taken off the streets were placed so they could sleep off their night's revelries. Cases of drunkenness had become a menace since the war began. More likely someone was sick in there. Dinah leaned a hip against the billiard table, so it was closed off until a charwoman could be sent to clean up. Well, I need to get on, and I doubt this soldier you mentioned could have gone far. That's a funny thing. Dinah heaved herself effortlessly up onto the edge of the billiard table, her hands on either side of her knees, feet swinging. He was about to be discharged in a few days, so we don't know what he's playing at. The missing man was likely a disabused soldier, reluctant to return to his unit, so had absconded. Not that Hannah could blame him for that. It was a common theme in the hospital, that any soldier who claimed they wanted to return to the trenches was a liar. How long has he been missing? Hannah approached the table where the ledger recording books lent out was kept, and she listed the ones Dinah had brought. Not sure. Dinah rolled a red billiard ball idly between her hands, He wasn't in his bed when Nurse Dalgleish woke the ward at six. She assumed he must be in the bathroom. But he hadn't come back by the time breakfast was served, so she reported it to Sister Ribbert. Hannah hefted a ledger from a drawer and placed it on the central desk, ready to enter the day's borrowings and returns. Knowing the sister's reputation, sympathy surged for Nurse Dalgleish at having lost a patient. Dinah flicked the red ball with a finger, sending it across to the far. She tore a strip off the poor girl in front of the entire ward, as if his going off was her fault. Busy night, was it? Hannah toured the room, collecting books discarded on chairs and one from the windowsill. Chaos it were. Convoy of ambulances arrived last night that kept us busy. Most of the poor lads had lain in wet mud for hours at the casualty stations before the hospital trains picked them up, only to be bumped and thrown about all the way across the country. Many were sick on the boats after that, so were in a poor state by the time they arrived. Three of them died before they even got here. How sad. Hannah closed her eyes in brief sympathy, having heard similar stories in the last week alone. She approached the stage at the far end of the room, where a set of full-height royal blue curtains hung from the proscenium, the women's social and political union motto, 
deeds, not words, embroidered in gold across the centre, together with the WHC monogram. Dinah? she asked, frowning. Was there a performance or meeting held in here last night, do you know? After the mystery of the locked door, she had suddenly noticed the curtains, usually left open, were drawn shut. Not that I know of. Dinah dropped to the floor, her soft shoes making no sound as she joined Hannah. Do you want a hand opening them? That would be helpful. They're so heavy. Spotting a book lying on the edge of the stage, Hannah stepped up onto the platform to retrieve it. A slip of paper fell from between the pages and floated to her feet. As she bent to retrieve it, her foot struck something hard. Shoving the scrap of paper into her pocket, she lifted the bottom of the curtain, revealing a brown leather shoe. The sole clean but well-worn. Intrigued that someone had left the shoe behind, she lifted the curtain higher. What she saw then made no sense. The shoe was attached to a leg in navy blue striped pyjamas, worn by a man lying on his back on the stage. One leg lay bent at an angle at the knee, the other thrust straight out. He wore a flannel dressing gown tied at the waist with a silken cord, his arms crossed loosely over his chest. Hannah's first thought was that he had collapsed, maybe because he was drunk or from some sort of attack. Then she saw the blood. A wide bloom of deep red seeped into the material of his pyjama jacket, as if to stem the flow. More blood had pooled beneath him, the surface puckered into tiny waves that spread on the wooden floor. Her vision tunnelled, taking Hannah back to the day she had found the body of her best friend, Lillianne Soames, stabbed and left in a wing-back chair in her bookshop. The same disbelief mixed with an urge to run flooded through her. My God! Dinah's shout broke the heavy silence. That's Sergeant Tillman! Is he dead? I think he must be. Hannah said, horrified, but unable to look away. Then she noticed a wheel-backed chair lay on its side a few feet away, as if he had kicked it aside as he fell. Dinah hitched her skirt with one hand, the other braced on the edge of the foot-high stage and hauled herself up beside the body. Where did all that blood come from? she asked, more curious than distressed. Squatting, she reached out her hand to take the man's wrist. Don't touch him. Hannah sprang forward, her hand closing on Dinah's upper arm. You'd better fetch someone quickly. All right, but it's not as if we can do anything for him now, poor bloke. Shrugging, she retracted her hand and backed away. Then the only sound above the roaring in Hannah's ears was Dinah's footsteps retreating along the hall. Left alone with a dead man, Hannah summoned the courage to study him. His eyes were closed, his mouth contorted into a grimace, revealing a top row of uneven, slightly yellowing teeth. The skin on his face and neck was flaccid and greyish beneath a fine layer of dark stubble from his nose downwards into his neck. She examined the book that was still in her hand, a copy of Something Fresh by P.G. Woodhouse. There was nothing remarkable about it. No hasty words scrawled in the margin, or pages with the corners folded back. Had he been reading it when he fell? Or was it just one left by a patient the previous day? Rapid footsteps approached, halting her speculations. Dinah appeared in the company of a pale-haired young V.A.D., followed by two women in full nurse's uniform, their wimple-style headdresses lifting out behind them. Nurse Root, what has happened here? One woman demanded. I don't know, Sister Ibert, Dinah replied. We found him like this a few minutes ago. Tutting, 
grunting as she mounted the step and bent over the body. Is he dead? The second woman asked, but she did not approach the stage. Hannah recognised her as Sister Kerr, a popular member of staff. I would say so. Sister Hibbert peered closer. I cannot see what caused it, but if all this blood is anything to go by, he's been attacked. She gestured to the two girls, but only Dinah stepped forward. What was the patient doing in the library at night? She addressed the room, then turned a hard glare on the scared-looking nurse who hovered beside Sister Kerr. Nurse Stalgleish, when did you last check on the ward? Uh, uh, I'm not sure, Sister. The young nurse hunched her shoulders. He, he, he was dozing when I collected the empty cocoa cups at around ten o'clock. When I checked again at around midnight, his bed was empty. I assumed he had gone to the bathroom, but... Assumed? Didn't you find out for sure? The sister left the stage and came to stand a few feet away from the girl. Patients shouldn't be out of bed after lights out. I, I know, sister, but we were very busy last night. I was helping make up beds for the new arrivals. Don't shout at her, sister. Sister Kerr stepped between them. She's new here and cannot be expected to keep track of everyone. Perhaps Nurse Root knows more. No, sister, I didn't speak to him at all last night, Dinah stammered. This is unacceptable. Sister Hibbert planted both hands on her hips, giving all appearances of taking charge. Nurse Root, go and fetch a couple of porters to take the body to the mortuary. Uh, perhaps you, Sister Kerr, could fetch Dr. Murray. She'll be in her office about now. When Nurse Root returns, she and Nurse Dalgleish are to wait in the nurse's common room. Dr. Murray will want to talk to both of you as you were on duty last night. Of course, sister. Giving Nurse Dalgleish's shoulder a reassuring pat, the sister Kerr left the room. Excuse me, sister. Hannah stepped out from where the curtain had half concealed her. I'm not medical staff here, but shouldn't the body be left where it is until the police get here? Who are you? The woman's suspicious gaze moved rapidly up from Hannah's toes up to her hair. Uh, Hannah Merrill? She replied, unsure of her role in the drama unfolding in front of her. The woman blinked, momentarily confused, before her face cleared. Yes, yes, of course you are. Well, we cannot leave a dead body lying here in the library. Anyone could wander in. Dismissing Hannah, she jabbed a finger at Dinah. What did I just tell you, Nurse Root? A neat, spare woman in her forties entered the room, followed closely by Sister Kerr. I can hear ye all the way down the corridor, Sister. I expect more decorum from my nursing staff. I can only... A Apologise, Dr. Murray. Sister Hibbert's brusque demeanour softened into subservience. The missing soldier has been found, but I'm afraid he's dead. What was he doing in the library? Dr. Murray approached the stage to view the body, but did not climb onto the stage. That's a mystery to us, Doctor. Sister Hibbert held up one side of her skirt and climbed down onto the main floor. I was just questioning these girls, but no one appears to know anything. She encompassed Hannah in her girl's remark, which made her smile. And you, Sister Kerr? The doctor in charge turned her attention to the woman who hovered uncertainly behind her. I cannot say, Doctor... I only came on shift half an hour ago. Uh, I've asked the porter to summon the police. Oh, but I don't think that's... The blonde girl took a step forward. Don't interrupt your superiors, Nurse Dalgleish. Sister Hibbert snapped. Shriveling beneath Sister Hibbert's uncompromising tone, the girl clamped her lips shut and took a step back. 
That's enough, sister. Dr. Murray moved to stand between them. Let's leave the questioning to the police, shall we? Of course, Dr. Murray, Sister Hibbert said, determined not to relinquish what little authority she had. I've instructed Nurse Root to have the sergeant's body taken to the mortuary. Stay where you are, Nurse Root. Dr. Murray halted Dinah, who had moved towards the door. The body must nay be touched, and no one must come into the library until the police arrive. My apologies if I have offended, Dr. Murray. Sister Hibbert bowed her head, resembling a nun accepting penance. No one crossed the doctor in charge without consequences. Don't worry, sister. You did what you thought best. Dr. Murray turned her attention to the two VADs. Nurse Root and Nurse Dalgleish go with Miss Merrill and... Uh, sister Hibbert, you come with me and Sister Kerr... Make sure you lock this door behind us. Of course, Dr. Murray. Sister Kerr took up her place at the door and waylaid Nurse Dalgleish, who apart from Hannah was the last person to leave. Are you all right, dear? You've come very pale. I do feel a little queasy. The young nurse cast a fearful glance over one shoulder at the stage. But I shall be fine in a moment, sister. Hannah entered the hallway, aiming a sympathetic smile at the younger nurse who waited as Sister Kerr locked the library door behind them. You look a bit shaky to me, girl. Sister Kerr slid the key into her pocket and grasped her by the arm. Come with me and I'll get you some smelling salts. No, really, I'm all right. I don't... Hannah looked back but curious staff had begun drifting out of the rooms on either side of the corridor, blocking Hannah's view of the pair. Her last sight was of the sister's face held an inch from the young nurse as she said something to her. Nurse Dalgleish merely nodded and stared at the floor. Are you coming with us or no, Miss Merrill? Dr. Murray called, her raised voice making Hannah jump. Beside her, Dinah wore a pleased smirk that Hannah was being treated like one of the nursing staff. Yes, yes, of course, Dr. Murray. Hannah turned and ran to catch up with her. Chapter Two Hannah eased her back on the hard chair she had occupied for the last half hour in the nurse's common room. Furnished with second-hand and donated items, the room carried a medley of odours that ranged from old leather to wet dog and decayed flowers. Tempted to ask what was taking so long, she felt a rush of remorse. That poor man had fought for his country, survived an injury, and now lay dead on the library stage. Why was he even there? And why place a chair on the stage when the room held more comfortable options? Was he hiding from whoever might venture into the library? Dinah, why do you suppose Sergeant Tillman was in the library at night? Don't ask me. Dinah perched on the corner of the wide sill where the window met the wall. Maybe he couldn't sleep, so went there to have a quiet read. That seems an odd thing to do. Especially when a perfectly good lamp occupied space on his bedside table. A woman, maybe? <laughs> now you're having a laugh, ain't you? Dinah scoffed. No one would be interested in him. He couldn't say a kind word if his life depended on it, let alone be agreeable to a woman. Hannah did not dismiss the idea lightly. The sergeant had been a well-built man in his early thirties. Although his features displayed the cast of death when she saw him for the first time, smoothed out in life, he would have been more than presentable. How well do you know Nurse Dalgleish, Dinah? Alice? She's all right, I suppose. Dinah pursed her lips in thought. Come to think, no one knows anything about her. She don't talk much. Is she a good nurse? She's not been here long, but she's a hard worker. 
We ain't real nurses, you see, not being qualified. So us VADs do all the scut work around here. But I don't mind. I've already got my first aid certificate. I've passed my first aid examination and hope to train for the Queen Alexandra's one day, she said proudly. I doubt Alice will, though. Why do you say that? Have you heard her talk? Dinah scoffed. She's posh, she is. Not a charwoman's daughter from Whitechapel like me. This was said without a trace of bitterness. She makes mistakes sometimes, like we all did when we first arrived, so I can't hold that against her. She turned her nose up at the nurses' dormitories too, said the attics were gloomy and not private enough. Not that I blame her. What do you want to know for? Just curious. Hannah noticed the nurse had not joined them. Where is she, by the way? Didn't Dr. Murray say we had to wait in here? Yes, yeah, she did. Dinah frowned at the door. She must still be with Sister Kerr. I expect she'll be long when she's ready. Deciding to use the girl's absence to probe further, Hannah asked, Alice looked shocked when she saw the body, but no more than anyone else. Sister Kerr reacted as if she was having a fit of the vapours. I saw that too, but then Sister Kerr is protective of the younger nurses. Dinah thought for a moment. Night shift is tough on us all, and if you ain't used to the sight of blood, it's worse. And there was plenty around the sergeant. I noticed. Hannah hoped not to see anything as gruesome again. Pushing the image of the dead sergeant away, she changed tack. Alice is very attractive, isn't she? And only only girls like me go into nursing, eh? Only mild sarcasm. I didn't mean it that way. Hannah rushed to reassure her. Dinah was far from plain, but she lacked the symmetry of features that made Nurse Dalgleish striking. She tried to summon a compliment to neutralise her lack of tact, but Dinah grinned at her, unoffended. Just teasing you, miss. I learned a long time ago I weren't much to look at. She switched her attention to the courtyard. Ah, I see the Flatfoots have arrived. Hannah joined Dinah at the window in time to see a long black motor car halt on the cobbles. The rear door opened and a tall man in a dark suit and black hat emerged. He vaulted up the front steps, then paused as a lady exited the building, removed his hat and stood to one side to allow her to descend. Hannah took a rapid step back from the window. No, him, do ya? Dinah smiled. Is he the one who caught the murderer of that lady in your bookshop? Hannah nodded. Detective Inspector Aidan Farrell. Thought that must be him. Archie couldn't stop talking about how he was helping the police from Scotland Yard. Hannah's first meeting with Inspector Farrell had been over the body of her best friend in the bookshop several months before. He struck her then as unsympathetic with a brusque manner. The discovery of a German spy ring working out of the bookshop had changed his attitude, partly because he required her cooperation, not to mention a burgeoning interest in Aunt Violet. One her aunt remained frustratingly closed-mouthed about even now. It was an exciting time, and a nerve-wracking one. By this time, the inspector had disappeared inside the building, followed by a second man she did not recognise. A short while later, footsteps were heard approaching in the hall, one set lighter than the other, sending Dinah from the windowsill as the door opened to admit the doctor in charge. Ah, Miss Merrill, Dr Murray said, as if she had forgotten her existence. This is Detective Inspector Farrell from Scotland Yard and his associate, uh, Detective Constable Pendleton, Inspector Farrell answered for her his blue eyes widening in recognition when he saw Hannah. I hope you'll both spare him a few moments to detail what occurred earlier, Dr. Murray asked both girls. Nurse Root, 
Wait out in the hall, would you? You'll be called when required, but there's nothing for either of you to worry about. She... Where is Nurse Delgleish? We aren't sure, Hannah answered. She didn't follow us in here. Maybe she was called away? How inconsiderate of her, she tutted. Nurse Root, would you be so kind as to find her for us? Yes, Dr. Murray. Dinah followed Detective Pendleton from the room, muttering as she went. At this rate, my shift will start before I get any sleep at all. Thank you for your cooperation, Dr. Murray. The inspector inclined his head politely. I'll try not to keep your staff away from their duties for long. Just a few routine questions, Miss, um, Merrill, is it? His right eyebrow rose in a parody of innocent inquiry, along with a slight but unmistakable shake of his head. I'm always happy to assist the police in any way I can. Hannah returned his gaze without flinching. I'll leave you to it then, Inspector. Dr. Murray reverted to her customary no-nonsense tone. I have a great deal of work to do, and this matter has put me behind. The door closed behind her with a soft click. Sorry about the play-acting. Inspector Farrell tossed his hat onto the side table and gestured her into the chair she had just vacated. Thanks for going along with it. You're welcome. But why the subterfuge? She smiled, becoming more intrigued by the second. What do you think of Dr. Murray? Impressive, isn't she? She is indeed. It was a thought-provoking first meeting. He tugged at an earlobe with a thumb and forefinger. She reminds me of your Aunt Violet in some respects. Goodness! Hannah fluttered her eyelashes. Two strong women who know what they want. How will you cope? I sometimes wonder about that myself, he chuckled. I'd appreciate it if you didn't mention we know one another. Which shouldn't be too difficult. You aren't likely to run into her in the hallways. Aunt Violet spends most of her time at the bookshop these days, and her Red Cross work keeps her busy. Is it true you were the one to find the body? He focused on the real reason he was there. Me and Nurse Root. Hannah shivered slightly in the chilled room as she took up Dinah's perch in the window corner where the sun had warmed the spot. She crossed her ankles. This is the second time in six months you've... St I hope this isn't going to become a habit, he said with a wry smile. With anyone else, that would be terrible luck, if not suspicious. Or should I blame incompetent doctors for allowing a patient to be murdered? It's not like I go looking for them. Hannah glared at him. And there are no incompetents here, despite the war office's cynicism. She had become fiercely protective of the women of Endell Street. No, you're right, that was uncalled for. He dragged a chair closer and sat. I apologise for my clumsy sense of humour. You're forgiven. Incidentally, how did the sergeant die? I saw all the blood, but it was difficult to tell exactly what caused it. He was shot. I've instigated a search for the murder weapon, which could be a fruitless task in a building this size. The killer could have taken it with them. Hannah frowned. Could a patient have brought a weapon into the hospital with them? I shall have to check, but I would imagine any weapons that found their way here would be confiscated. That's what I thought. Only a staff nurse told me a Turco once brought a German Picklehauber helmet onto the ward in a canvas bag and refused to part with it. Turcos are those Algerian soldiers serving in the French army, aren't they? 
He nodded sagely as if answering his own question. It's a tradition for soldiers to collect souvenirs from the battlefield. Been doing it since Marlborough. Maybe, but this one had a severed head still inside. Hannah fought a smile as she waited for his reaction. What? His jaw went satisfyingly slack. You're joking. She shook her head. The Turco was most put out and insisted he needed it to prove his warrior status in his home village. Dr. Murray informed him it was unhygienic and unchristian, though as a Muslim that meant nothing to him. He gave in eventually, but he wasn't happy. What happened to it? He asked, his curiosity evidently stronger than his distaste. Hannah shrugged. Buried in a local grave, I would imagine? She had felt nauseous when she heard the same story during her first week at the library, but she delivered it with relish. Is there anything you can tell me about Sergeant Tillman? He asked, taking a moment to compose himself. She asked, archly testing their relationship, while redirecting him from the image of severed heads. It could be. His eyes glinted with mischief as he withdrew a notebook from an inside pocket and flipped through it, a pencil poised above a page. State your full name. Hannah stared at him. Hmm, he murmured. Witness unhelpful. He scribbled something on the page. Inspector Farrell, she rolled her eyes. All right, I'll apologise for the severed head story. Now, do you know what sort of gun was used? Why, have you seen one lying about? He clamped his lips shut and lowered the notebook. You know I cannot discuss specific details with you, Hannah. It's bad enough I have no manpower to assign to this case. This new conscription law means young men aren't entering the police force, so we're struggling. He tapped his pencil against the page. But we know one thing. It was a single shot with a large calibre bullet, most probably fired from a Webley revolver, Mark V or VI, most probably. Webley's an army issue, aren't they? He nodded. And they're not called man-stoppers for nothing. The entry wound was relatively small. But the exit... He rolled his neck inside his collar. Big as my fist, it was. Made a right mess, I can tell you. Hannah pushed away the image this conjured in her head. Then the killer is most probably a soldier? I cannot assume that at this stage. Finding the weapon is our first task. Although with over 500 soldiers in this building, unless the killer left fingerprints, it could belong to anyone. He sounded defeated already, which did not bode well. Hannah wondered how many of the patients were fit enough to make their way to the library and use a gun. A quick assessment told her probably about half of them, maybe more. Hannah? His tone was sharp, telling her it was not the first time he had asked. She blinked, startled. Sorry, what did you say? Dr. Murray said another nurse was present when you found the body at around 8.15. Is that your usual start time to begin work? Dinah Root, yes. She's Archie's sister. Your assistant at the bookshop? He raised an eyebrow and scribbled in his notebook. She was on the... But I was earlier than usual today. Was there a particular reason for that? A sharp retort sprang onto her tongue, but she suppressed it, reminding herself there was nothing personal about his questions. Or was there? No reason at all, she answered carefully. Call it a whim. Did you have much contact with the dead man? As a librarian, she pulled a face. Apart from the exchange of polite greetings like, how are you feeling? Isn't it a nice day? Or 
Would you like to borrow a book? I'd say no. His wry smile told her she was being flippant, but he made no comment. No one seems to know much about Tillman, but I hope to get an impression of him from his regimental commander, who, knowing my luck, will be in Artois, or somewhere. She looked away quickly, and he sighed. Oh, Lord, Hannah, I'm sorry, I, I forgot for a moment. That was where your fiancé was killed, wasn't it? I didn't mean to raise painful memories. You didn't. She smoothed down her skirt, conscious of his sympathetic scrutiny. It's been months, and you never met Gerald. No apology is necessary. Mention of her late fiancé always made her uncomfortable, in that most people expected her to be heartbroken, her life shattered by another young life laid waste on a muddy battlefield, when in truth her heart remained whole. If it helps, I could keep an ear open for you. She found the idea of another murder case strangely appealing. You said you were short-handed, so... I could be of use. Are you implying my men aren't up to the job? He raised a sardonic eyebrow. Of course not. However, the staff here are fiercely loyal. They'd be wary of saying anything incriminating to a policeman, but perhaps less so to a librarian. She leaned forward. A murder on the premises is bound to create rumours and speculation. This is a police matter, Hannah. You're a potential witness. I'm not comfortable asking you to help. You aren't. I volunteered. And you accepted my help the last time. Before he could respond, she rushed on. The fitter patients gather in the library to play billiards, cards, or, or listen to the phonograph. If you think women... My mother's bridge afternoons are less shocking. I'm very discreet. They would never know I was listening in. Her enthusiasm grew as she talked. I cannot base an investigation on gossip. Although... He stared off for a moment, then shook his head. No, it's not professional. It might be dangerous. Remember what happened when I set you up as bait to catch a spy? You were attacked. A man battered me with a door in his eagerness to get away, which hardly constitutes an attack, Hannah scoffed. And you caught him, eventually. She suppressed a slight shudder as she recalled the incident when a German spy had confronted her in the empty bookshop. The click of the door catch brought their combined attention to where Detective Pendleton stuck his head round the jam, though he did not enter the room. Sorry to interrupt, sir, but Miss Dalgleish appears to have left the building. What? I need to interview her. Inspector Farrell glared at him, as if he was solely responsible. I know, sir. A porter saw her getting into a hansom in the street. He wasn't aware of the situation, or we would have stopped her. Let's hope she's simply gone home and not done a bunk. The inspector sighed. Could you let Dr. Murray know I expect her to make herself available when she returns? Oh, and I'll need her address. Yes, sir. The detective withdrew rapidly. Oh, dear. Hannah began slightly sheepish. I apologise for not saying anything when she didn't come to the common room. It didn't occur to me she had left. Hmm, that's rather odd behaviour. She was told I need to interview all the staff who were on duty last night. I suppose so, but not everyone is familiar with police procedures, Hannah pointed out. Even so, I don't like the idea she's avoiding me. Although something tells me her statement will be a repetition of everyone else's, no one seems to have seen or heard anything. Unless she's the killer, Hannah said. Well, there is that. He exhaled a frustrated breath. To be honest, I'm at a loss with this one. 
Dr. Murray informed me she has over a hundred staff and five hundred patients in this building. I have no idea where to begin. He stroked his chin thoughtfully. Look, if you do hear something relevant on your travels, will you bring it to me? No questioning of witnesses, though. Is that understood? Asking wasn't that hard, was it? It was hardly a formal request, but close enough if she was called upon to defend herself later. Actually, there is something which might interest you. Which is? When I arrived this morning, the library was locked, which is unusual. Nurse Dinah Root said the key was where it should be at the front desk. How did Sergeant Tillman know which one to take when it wasn't labelled? Interesting point. He stroked his chin thoughtfully. Unless someone unlocked the library for him. But he couldn't have locked it again, could he? Dead men cannot lock doors. And how did the killer leave the hospital? The gates are locked at night. I could try to find out if... Hannah? His sharp tone silenced her. This murder was not a casual act of violence. Whoever wanted Tillman dead planned it. He could still be in the building, so it could be dangerous. Please, be careful. I'm always careful, she shrugged. Well, nearly always. Chapter 3 Hannah arranged books on the portable trolley in preparation for her book round, while recalling her first visit to the hospital. The sight of the old St Giles workhouse with its austere grey buildings, set around a central square inside a high brick wall, confirmed all her worst imaginings of a Victorian workhouse. Built on a former leper colony, it was reputed to have been used by Dickens as a model for Oliver Twist. She had to steel herself during those first weeks as she wheeled the book trolley among seriously injured men, some bandaged from head to foot, and others in painful-looking leg or arm braces that prevented them moving. Within a few days, her time spent among the hard-working, dedicated staff and the stoic soldiers had altered her perspective, as did the light-hearted banter of the recovering soldiers eager to exchange small talk and hear news of the outside world. Bracing her arms against the handle of the loaded book trolley, she headed for the lift to take her to St Anne's ward on the floor above. After a brief wait, the lift arrived, and with a nod to the porter who sprang forward and held open the lift cage, she manoeuvred the wieldy contraption inside. All wards at Endell Street bore the name of female saints. St Anne's being where the less seriously injured were treated before returning to their regiments. Hannah enjoyed their cheerful back, but often wondered how long it would be before the laughter stopped, and reality set in for those men with life-changing injuries who face survival in an unsympathetic world. The whirring of the heavy lift ceased, and it bumped to a halt. Sliding open the cage door, she wheeled the heavy trolley into the corridor. Grateful she did not have to venture onto the three wards on the top floor in the south block, referred to as the zoo, where the grievously injured and dying were cared for. The men there had no need for books. Their groans of agony combined with the pungent smells of necrotic flesh and strong antiseptic pervaded the entire building. In St Anne's ward, the long rows of beds were arranged against the walls, with a central table that held a vase filled to overflowing with forget-me-nots, frothy-headed hyacinths, lilacs and fritillaria, brought in daily from patrons' gardens, their fragrance vying with the acrid, sickly smells of carbolic and disinfectant. No utilitarian blinds, grey blankets or bare painted walls proliferated at Endell Street. Here the men enjoyed a homely, colourful environment, where the metal beds sported crimson coverlets, side tables and reading lamps. Handmade curtains adorned the row of windows that ran along one side, while landscapes donated by generous patrons hung on the walls. 
moving slowly from bed to bed. Hannah exchanged greetings with the patients about the weather, letters from home, and which books the men had enjoyed. Hannah halted the book trolley at the far end, near a bed occupied by a handsome Irish corporal, who was interested in the works of James Joyce. She had ordered several titles from Moody's circulating library for him. Good morning, Corporal Doyle. Hannah's gaze went to the copy of the Dubliners on his nightstand. I see you finished the book. Did you enjoy it? The story of Evelyn is my favourite. I found it depressing myself. He pitched the last word as if he asked a question. A life wasted, if you ask me. He lounged fully dressed on top of his made-up bed, shirt sleeves rolled to the elbows and shoeless feet crossed. Perhaps, but the story also has a poignancy. Though Joyce doesn't like the English much and blames us for his country's backwardness. Realising what she had said, she stiffened. I'm sorry, I almost forgot you're Irish. Don't you fret. His mouth quirked into a wry smile. I'm from Belfast, a very different Ireland. He p I see you aren't wearing your sling today. First day without it? He grasped his right upper arm with his hand and rolled his shoulder to show how well it had healed from a sniper's bullet. You'll be leaving us soon then? Aye, and at least I'll be walking out. Not like him. His full lips turned up at the corner in a sneer his eyes hard. Suppose you heard what happened in the night. Hannah aimed a brief nod at the stripped and empty bed opposite. It was odd him being found in the library, wasn't it? She said, aiming for nonchalance. Someone said he'd been shot. Is that true? I'm not privy to the details, Hannah said quickly. It seemed the hospital gossip machine was in good order. Can't imagine what he was doing there in the middle of the night, Corporal Doyle said. Probably couldn't sleep, so he went for a walk. You spoke to him when he left? Hannah asked, her interest piqued. Nah, but I dropped off soon after evening cocoa and slept through until the nurse woke me. Best night's sleep I've had since I got here. You didn't hear the shot? No, had I done... I would have recognised it for what it was and told...